price of redemption. My name is Daniel Vallis from InformedChristians.com, a website ministry devoted to discerning current events from a Christian and biblical perspective. This is a warning, but it is not a prediction. I do not know the future. In our last video on the harvest, I just briefly mentioned about the resurrections, and some people had some question about it, so I just wanted to clarify it a little bit for you. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those of us who are alive and remain will go with them as well. Now, of course, most of the church body has already died off. Over the past 2,000 years, the majority of the church is dead. There's only a few of us alive and remaining of it, but the majority are dead, and they will rise in Christ first. And the Bible also specifies that with this, we will also be changed. We will put off the mortal body. We will receive an immortal body. We will no longer be flesh and blood, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So this is what makes the dead in Christ rising different than the resurrections. The dead in Christ will not be coming back ever to their body. They will never again have a flesh and blood body. They are going on to bigger and better. They will have a changed immortal body. So they will never be resurrected to their old body again. During the tribulation, those that are beheaded for the witness of Christ, the Bible tells us that their souls will go to heaven, but their souls wait at the altar in heaven. They are not given an immortal body in heaven. They are told to wait until after the tribulation. And then they return at the end of the tribulation. And they rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And that is part of their reward for being a martyr, enduring to the end of their particular race. And the Bible specifies in Revelation 24 that this period is called the first resurrection. And he specifies that only those that were beheaded will be returning at this point. The very word resurrection means stand up again. The martyrs who were beheaded during the tribulation, they are coming back to their flesh and blood body. That is why it is a resurrection. They are returning, resurrected. They are coming back to their flesh and blood body. And that's what's different from the dead in Christ rising at the rapture. They are never, ever coming back to their flesh and blood body again. During the tribulation, there's going to be many casualties, saved and unsaved. When you consider all the disease and pestilence and war and explosions and tsunamis and all that, there's going to be a lot of people who are casualties. And that would put them in the category of the second resurrection. All of the remaining dead, as the Bible says in Revelation 20. They will not be raised to their flesh and blood body again till the end of the world at the great white throne. When they are raised up and they stand in their body before the great white throne and receive their particular judgments handed down. So that is the difference between these three different events. Two are resurrections where the people are returning to their former body. But the dead in Christ rising, along with the bride being snatched away, those receive an immortal body. They will never again be flesh and blood. And they are going to reside in the new Jerusalem. So now that we've touched on that, let's review where we are today. So much is going on, and it's so easy to forget with the fast-paced world we live in. So let's just focus on what is important at the moment. We've seen different signs of Jonas, and we've seen the storms. Most people depending on where you are in the world, focus on, well, it either happened in Washington or the UK. This storm of Jonas has been going on for a week's period. It hit Washington and New York and then swung over and hit the UK. So this has been an extra long sign, and it should catch our attention, the sign of Jonas hitting America's largest cities, Washington, D.C., and New York City, and then making a very noticeable impact. And then, of course, the uptick in whales beaching at the same time should catch our attention. And then the celestial signs in the heavens right now, with the five planets, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter, just so you can all see them all at once. And it's not going to be for much longer, just a few more days will you really be able to see the whole collection. And of course, Comet Catalina, which names means purify. This is coming through on just a one-time trip. And then also at the same time that the sign of Jonas was occurring was a particular cloud formation that got a lot of media attention. And it's easy to dismiss certain clouds and formations as, oh, that's just what someone reads into it. But it should catch our attention when even the photographer mentioned that there was all sorts of people outside stopping what they were doing and looking at it because it caught their attention. And then it has caught people's attention in the social media, and so many people are referencing it as the hand of God. So we should take note that that is how it is impressed upon people, and that is what they are seeing. 
So we do need to take note of it, especially the fact that it happened right in that exact same window of the sign of Jonas. And then just the other day was a massive fireball over northeast U.S. and even parts of southeast Canada. And specifically, it went over Washington, D.C. Baltimore, New Jersey, New York, Michigan, and Ontario, people saw it there. But most noticeably, right over Washington, D.C. So again, that should arrest our attention that God is trying to get our attention during this time. So much going on in this narrow window. Sudden destruction is coming. We have heard the calls for peace and safety. So just now about we're hitting 80-day marker from that. Sudden destruction is coming, and the sign of Jonas is letting us know that it is even closer than we think. On the 5th and 6th this week, the Sabbath, there's some very interesting Torah readings that are associated with the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is referred to as a special Sabbath. The normal Torah reading for this section is even nicknamed Judgments, because it particularly covers the instructions to the children of Israel and with the warnings that judgment would come if they did not follow them. So that's why this particular week's reading has its nickname of Judgments, which should catch our attention in light of all the signs we're seeing and the warnings of sun destruction. When a section of reading and a whole Sabbath has the name associated with it, with Judgments coming up right in this context, now that should catch our attention. But then also the exact same Sabbath is what's called a special Sabbath. But it's associated with this shekel. Shabbat Shekelim or the Sabbath of the Shekel. It is the Sabbath on or before the new moon of the last month of the spiritual year. It is a reminder that each adult male Jew must contribute half of a biblical shekel for the upkeep of the tabernacle once a year. The half shekel was collected on the first day of month 12 sometimes, or sometimes this day marked the announcement that it was almost due on the first day of the month Nisan. Shabbat Shekelim is the first of four special Sabbaths that derive their name from the additional Torah portion that is read when they occur each year. Two are before Purim and two are before Passover. So this Sabbath that is coming up in just a few days is very special because it has multiple things associated with it. For the Sabbath of the Shekel, the normal reading is 2 Kings 11.17. Then that talks about Joash collecting the money, which was this ransom money, for the repair of the temple. The extra reading portion that goes with this particular Sabbath is the Exodus 30, 11 through 16. Let's look at that. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them, this they shall give every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel, after the shekel of the sanctuary, a shekel is twenty geras, and a half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered from twenty years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your souls. Several key words should catch our attention. They have to give this half shekel as a symbolic ransom for their soul, to make an atonement for their soul. It's even called the atonement money, but it's a memorial. Obviously, it won't take away their sins or redeem their soul or atone for their soul, but it is a memorial for that. And there is a judgment associated if they don't complete this memorial. And this atonement money is collected just a few days before Passover. Now this is what a half shekel looks like. And it went through several different variations depending on the time period. But a half shekel, this is what every male 20 years and up was expected to give. So this day that is coming up in just a few days is associated with the idea of ransoming, redeeming, atonement, and a memorial. Usually the money is either collected on this day or it's to announce that it's almost due and it needs to be turned in over the next few weeks because Passover is coming up very soon. So this is very interesting considering that we've just covered the feasts and what they represent and we have already talked about the Day of Atonement. So now we find a very interesting memorial and reminder that the ransom is going to be collected and is almost due. Very interesting reminder. But then also, coupled with the concept of judgments. And it has different Torah readings associated with it. But one section caught my attention. 
Verse 14, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year, thou shalt keep the feast of the unleavened bread, thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month I bid. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, and the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of end gathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. And the feast of end gathering is the feast of tabernacles. It should not surprise us that at this time we find ourselves at now we're finding reminders about the first fruits harvesting the Feast of Tabernacles as well and that there is going to be a required attendance to these things. So on this day that's coming up in just a few days, there's reminders that point to both the Day of Atonement and the memorial, and we talked about how these days are memorials and shadows of the larger work that Christ is doing. And the concept of judgments, which is associated with the Day of Atonement. And that's when judgments are handed down. But then also the reminder of the Feast of Tabernacles. Both of these are interwoven on this day. And right now we find ourselves in between the shadow of the Feast of Trumpets and the shadow of the Day of Atonement. And right on our doorstep is a reminder about there needs to be an atonement. There needs to be a ransom. There needs to be a redemption paid. Coupled with judgments and a reminder about the Feast of Tabernacles. These Torah readings have been practiced for hundreds and thousands of years. Ezra, back in Nehemiah, he's the one who started it. They've been tweaked slightly over the years, but he's the one who started the yearly going through the Torah. So it should catch our attention when something that has been practiced for so long lands right in this time period that we find ourselves in now and is pointing to two of the shadows that we've been watching. We've heard the trumpet calls building and building during this shadow. But we are still in the days of Noah when people are not aware that judgment is looming over their heads. And in just a few days we find a reminder that the redemption is due and that there are judgments. I do need to point out that most of the Jewish calendars that people are going by have a leap year. And so they push this day back one month. And the only reason they have a leap year is because they're going by extra biblical standards found in the Talmud of every 19 years they just automatically have a leap year. That's not the biblical calendar method. So if you follow the biblical calendar method, this is not a leap year that we are currently still in. So this day is at this time instead of being pushed back a month. So that is why you won't find it listed on this day on most of the Jewish calendars that people follow. The half shekel, the idea of redemption. This fits exactly with the patterns and the shadows that we've been covering because it is a memorial. It is a shadow. It is a pattern that Christ wants us to have in front of us as a reminder, and it points to the larger work that he is doing. In our last two pattern videos, we talked about how the feasts are a pattern and a shadow of the redemptive work that Christ is doing. Now, the half shekel is collected just a few days before Passover. It's connected to that. It's a reminder. And what did Christ do? He came and paid our price. We could not pay the price for our sins. We could never, ever pay the price for our sins. Christ is the only one who could redeem us, who could save us, who could do the atoning work. And he paid the price. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 2,000 years ago, when he died on the cross, he looked forward in the future and saw you and me. And he saw the entire list of sins and transgressions that we would ever do. And he loved us so much that he was willing to pay that in full, the entire bill. And those who accept what he has done for them, he becomes our atonement. He has paid the price for our souls. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. The day that we believe on Jesus Christ and receive what he did on our behalf, that is the day that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Once we are redeemed, we are a purchased possession. We are not our own. We are redeemed. Someone else paid the price for us. Nothing we can do will ever change that. And so the day we believed is when we receive the Holy Spirit and we receive the sealing. It is a sealed deal. The bill is paid. We don't hold on to the receipt. We had nothing to do with paying the bill. We are the possession. And on Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit and he also sent the earnest of our inheritance. 
It's all the gifts that he gave on top of the inheritance and said, I'm good for my promises. He gave the earnest of the inheritance with the Holy Spirit and sealed us until the day of redemption. So the day that he redeemed us is when we were sealed. We are permanently his. He owns us. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of us is what seals us. We do not seal ourselves. Nothing we did sealed us. Nothing we ever did contributed to paying the bill. The Holy Spirit within us is what seals us till the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Christ paid the price, and all those who believe and trust in him and his finished work, they are sealed unto the day of redemption. One day he is going to pick up what he paid for. That is an amazing promise. And he said, in the meantime, we should live in light of that. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us when we believe on him. So let us live so that we can honor him and glorify him and he can shine through us. So not only are we atoned, but we are sealed. And part of the gift is being sealed and receiving the Holy Spirit, which does the sealing until the day of redemption. 2 Corinthians 1.22 Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is the gift from the bridegroom to his bride. The day we accept his engagement ring, we are sealed as his, being engaged to him, being his purchased possession. We are bought with a price. Nothing we can do will ever change that. And with the Holy Spirit working in us, enables us to grow the fruit of the Spirit in our life. That is a choice given to us. Every believer in Christ has the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the ability to grow the fruit of the Spirit in their life. The Bible reminds us, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We are redeemed. We have life. And because of that, we should walk in the Spirit. We should follow Christ. It's still a decision. We won't do it automatically. The Bible tells us we need to work out our salvation. It's not talking about we need to do something to contribute to our salvation. He's talking about now that you are saved, now that you are redeemed, now that you do have the Spirit, work out of that context. You are a redeemed, purchased possession. Live like it. You know, just like you work out your marriage. You're not making your marriage happen. You are working and living in light of that you are married. And the same is true when we work out our salvation. We are already sealed. But we should start living like it. We should start walking like it. And we should shine brightly. And we should live to glorify our Father and the one who has redeemed us. We should work to grow fruits in the Spirit. You know, the Bible gives so many examples of those who did not. And this is the whole crux of the parable of the prodigal son. Yes, we will stray off. That doesn't mean we have lost the Holy Spirit. We are sealed until the day of redemption. There's nothing we can do to lose that. Because we're not the one doing the sealing. And the Bible gives several examples in Corinthians of individuals who went into gross immorality. The Bible always said, treat them as your brother. They are still your brother, but you do need to address what's going on in their life. And the Bible gives the warning, quench not the spirit. We should not let the cares of this life grow in our heart. We should not quench the light that is burning. We should make sure we are shining as bright as possible. And this is the whole crux of the letters to the seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Are we receptive to what the Holy Spirit is saying in us? What we need to do? This is what defines the barley harvest. They don't need to be threshed because they can listen to the Holy Spirit leading them in their life and directing them of what they need to trim off, what they need to cast off, what we need to do, how we can shine brighter. That's what makes barley, not having the Spirit, because all Christians have the Spirit, but those that actually listen to Him and when we listen to him and let the fruits of the Spirit grow in our life, then people can see Christ in us and his light shines in us so brightly. And that is what Christ is looking for when he returns. Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. When is the first time he came? At Passover, when he paid the price, when he made the atonement, when he redeemed the purchased possession. The bride of Christ is that purchased possession, and we are looking for him to appear the second time, when our redemption, when the one who has made atonement for us, returns the second time. 
That is what we are looking for and that's how we should live. And that is why he gave the letters to the seven churches. You read the letters to the seven churches, two of them were wicked. How we live does not change our salvation. Our salvation is sure, it's sealed, but it does affect our relationship and our fellowship and our growth. And Christ wants us to listen to the Spirit that is in us because then we can grow the fruits of the Spirit. You know, the fruits of the Spirit is the gift that the bridegroom gave his bride. And how do you think he's going to feel when he shows up and she has never even used the gifts that he gave her? Christ wants us to shine brightly. Christ wants us to listen to the Spirit. Christ wants us to be winnowed by the Spirit so we are ready, so we are barley. So when he shows up the second time, we are ready. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We are redeemed. The atonement price has been made. And now we find ourselves at a time of year when this reminder is put right in our path in context of everything we see going on right now that our Redeemer is about to return the second time. We find ourselves between the shadow of the trumpets and the shadow of the Day of Atonement while we are still in the days of Noah but we are also given the reminder of judgment. Ephesians 1, 13-14 In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news, of your salvation, the one who paid the price, in whom also after that ye believed. You know, in the Jewish wedding model, they sealed the engagement by the two individuals drinking a cup of wine, and that signified that the engagement was sealed. When we believe in Christ, when we accept that he paid the price for our sins, and he is the only mediator between God and man, when we accept his atonement that he paid on our behalf, when we believe in him, then ye are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. Hebrews 10, 24-25 And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. The day of our redemption, or the purchased possession, is at the doors. May Christ find you serving Him, first and highest above all else, with an ear to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Maranatha.